So I'm Deepak Bhargav. I'm one of the product managers in the Crosswork team, and I'm going to introduce the Cisco Crosswork network controller. And after that, I'll hand it over to Krishnan, who is the technical marketing engineer uh, on the same team, and he'll actually show you the, uh, the solution in action. So in order to introduce the controller, or what I call CNC in short, uh, the, a good way to do that is to kind of talk about some of the use cases and challenges that the controller uh, is trying to address. And as you can see on this slide, you can see a very simplified view of the network. Um, uh, on the left side is the access connecting to the end customers or the sites going all the way to the right, connecting to the, to the centralized data center. On such a network, one of the challenge that uh, the customers face today is the provisioning of services. Because today when uh, we are trying to get to the, or the customers are trying to get to the revenues much faster, uh, it could take many weeks to provision a service. And that could involve deeper knowledge of the network infrastructure or device or vendor specific configurations or just the procedural bot bottlenecks. So what the controller offers is the intent-based uh, provisioning, basically automates uh, the provisioning based on the intent that you define. And we'll talk about in more detail. The second challenge that it's trying to address is the bandwidth swings. On this network, there can be many different applications or services that are running and they have different traffic characteristics. And clearly that could lead to uh, uh, bandwidth fluctuations and congestion points. And often the customers would over provision the network, which uh, leads to higher capex, but what the controller does, it gives them the ability to be able to react to these fluctuations by ongoing monitoring and optimization capabilities. And then the third challenge that I'm going to touch upon is when the congestion actually happens, because it results in deteriorating the end user you know, experience. And what the controller helps is in terms of the real time real-time optimization or what we call as a closed loop optimization where it's monitoring some of the key metrics in the network. And when it detects uh, congestion points or device failure or link failure, it would redirect the traffic or take actions to be able to mitigate the risk of congestion. And lastly, often we see that uh, the customers have many siloed products and that results in fragmented visibility. And of course, that leads to the operational overheads. What the controller does, it is actually an integrated solution, which has many capabilities uh, across the service uh, lifecycle, right from provisioning to visualization to monitoring and optimization. So let me go a little deeper into the uh, into the uh, uh, cross sort network controller and what. It is, is a turnkey solution which brings together many leading edge capabilities. As you can see on this slide, it includes the Cisco NSO, and I understand you had a, a session on NSO earlier today. And it also has the SRPCE, um, which is the segment routing path compute element, as well as number of crosswork applications all tied together, integrated under a common UI umbrella, common APIs, and that helps to simplify the operational experience for the customers. And not only that, but it has a gateway that helps to uh, ease the integration with any external system, as well as the crosswalk data gateway, which is the common collection infrastructure in this platform. So let me touch a little bit more on these components before we kind of get to what outcomes the controller is delivering for the customers. So we're talking about the NSO, as you kind of heard earlier today as well, it really helps in terms of streamlining and automating the day-to-day -day configuration task. What it helps you to achieve is the intent-driven deployment. So in the context of the network controller, it helps to expedite the service provisioning based on the intent. And the intent is expressed in the service models written in Yang, so it's fairly easy to extend. So that allows you to kind of modify the service definitions based on you know, what the uh, specific deployment requirements are. And, and once that's done, it, it's provisioned through the network controller. Now talking about the, the active topology and inventory, it helps you to visualize the services that you're provisioned and also provides visibility into the inventory uh, that is supporting 
the services as well as some of the data that we are collecting from the network. Talking about the optimization engine, which is quite key component in the uh, in 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 this solution, uh, it provides a real time path and bandwidth optimization, uh, conforming or trying to get uh, conformed to the policy that are defined with those services. And of course, it utilizes the SRPC for path computation, and and that conforms to some of the constraints that could be defined, could be based on uh, TE metrics, could be based on uh, IGP metric or affinity rules or path uh, diversity rules. And all these capabilities, as I mentioned before, it's under the common UI, which connects together many different use cases, as you can see on the right side, which allows the users to uh, provision the services, whether it's L2, L3 VPN services, uh, because what, what NSO brings in the context of the CNC is also the SRTE code function pack and the sample function packs for L2, L3 VPN services. So with the SRTE code function pack, it helps to configure the SRTE policies and instantiate the uh, services. And with the sample function pack for L2 and L3 VPN, it basically gives you the ability to extend it uh, and customize it based on what the specific uh, you know, customer needs are, and, and then that gets provisioned. And of course, it allows you to provision the SRTE policies associated with the service, it allows you to implement bandwidth optimization where the controller can um, basically do the tactical network uh, optimization when there is a congestion. And also you can implement the real time or what we call as a closed loop uh, optimization where it's monitoring the metrics like the BGP, uh, the bandwidth utilization and be able to take proactive steps to uh, mitigate or avoid the congestion issues. And of course, as I mentioned, you can visualize uh, the, the services. You can look at the inventory uh, under the same user interface. Now, let me go a little deeper before I actually hand it over to Krishnan and talk about some of how the different components within the controller interact and how does the controller work with uh, the underlying network infrastructure or even connecting to the systems outside. So as you can see on the right side, which is the orchestrator function, which is implemented by uh, the NSO, uh, it helps to uh, you know, expedite the provisioning of the services. But as the user is requesting the services through the UI or through the API, uh, it leverages the service uh, provisioning connector to talk to the NSO uh, through which the service provisioning happens. And then also the cross fork applications on the left uses the same connector to um, uh, to talk to the NSO to learn about you know, the, 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 the service inventory. Then talking about the device management, which I didn't mention before, is it's a key component in this platform where uh, it learns about the devices through BGPLS or through SRPC or simply uh, CSV import. And as the devices are onboarded, it's maintaining the device attributes like the IP address, credential, or uh, the uh, uh, SNMP settings, telemetry settings, which could be used for the different functions as part of the use cases delivered by the solution. Then optimization engine, as I mentioned before, leverages SRPCE for path computation, which in turn uses uh, the protocol like the BGPLS or IGP for gathering the service network state as well as the topology. And for any of the path, uh, dynamic path management, it uses the PSAP. Now coming to the collection function, uh, as you can see that is the data gateway is the common uh, collector, as I mentioned before, and it implements many different protocols uh, to collect the data from the multi-vendor network devices. And, and any of the interfaces in the solution is all standards-based interface. So not only it helps to support the multi-vendor devices, but also it eases the integration, whether it's a not bound applications or other uh, OSS systems. So this kind of gives you a quick glimpse into an introduction into the network controller, and I'll now transition to uh, to uh, to Krishnan for the demo. In the meantime, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. All right, uh, Krishnan, if you can go ahead and get your uh, screen shared, it looks like you're up there, and we're in a demo. Um, Prime Image, are we ready to go on Krishnan's side? And we're ready. All right, Krishnan, whenever you're ready, take it away. 
Uh, thank you, Deepak and Tom. Uh, so right now, what I'm going to show you is the Crossbook Network Controller demo, um, showing the use cases that uh, Deepak just explained. So what you're seeing is the web interface. Uh, so when you log in, this is the dashboard that you land on. And uh, as you can see here, we have uh, a rendition or a visualization of the um, topology. We call it active topology because this is built based on what the topology is currently, right? Um, the way it's done is we have a BGP link state session with all the routing domains uh, in large networks. There are more than one routing domain, ISIS or OSPF, um, you know, uh, domains, and uh, we get all that link state information through BGP link state, which is, by the way, standards based, so multiple vendors support it. And we can now visualize all the links, um, more than one uh, routing domain and show it to you, right? So that's what it's showing. When links go down, nodes go down, this topology will change and we are able to uh, find that and uh, adjust the topology uh, appropriately. And I'll show you in the demo uh, an instance of that. The other thing I want to point out is the link coloring and the link coloring currently is indicating how much traffic is flowing through these links. So once we discover the inventory of all the routing nodes and the links that are doing layer three, participating in layer three routing, we can now start polling the link um, interface counters, right? We know how busy a link is and we can show that to you. And that is super important for operations so that you know what is going on with your network. And also you want to know uh, if there is hotspots that are developing, right? Now, all of that's useful if you can actually overlay your service information on the same visualization, which is what I'm going to show you next. So on the right side, you see a bunch of services that are already deployed. I use Network Controller to deploy these services. And now if you go ahead and click one of them, um, and by the way, we can support, uh, just as uh, Deepak pointed out, uh, our focus is on transport uh, networks, large uh, transport networks that have built out full capacity and now they want to monetize uh, you know, VPNs and turning on a VPN for a customer in, uh, you know, turns out to be actually taking a lot of effort and time. You want to get to that service quickly so that you can actually start earning revenue. Also, you want to do more fancy services, fancy SLAs, which is where segment routing comes in. Um, if you're building homegrown products to deploy, now you have to deploy uh, segment routing, you have to bind them. And then you have to also do, um, optimization when your network changes to honor this new uh, SLAs, right? So all of that requires a little bit more centralized control, which is where the network controller comes in, right? So let's pick a visualization of how a segment routing policy would look. So I'm gonna pick the uh, first one here, which I already deployed. And as you can see here, we can actually overlay the path this SRTE policy, uh, the tunnel basically is gonna take, right? Um, think of it this as a, an underlay that multiple services can use or even a single service may use, right? And you can see here, we can show you all the uh, important information about this tunnel that was provisioned. In this case, it was a simple IGP-based um, optimization uh, and uh, you can have multiple paths and you can have constraints and uh, affinity as, as we call it. I'm gonna go and now show you, now let's say you have actually uh, deployed a point-to-point -point service on top of it. And if you have um, 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 a L2 VPN point-to-point -point service running on this, let me pick an example of uh, this service here. And let's take a look at that. Um, uh, pick the L3 VPN. Let me go back to L3 VPN. So now you can see here, we have picked an L2 VPN service, a virtual private wire service, um, and you can quickly visualize what path it goes through because we know that this service was bound to an SRTE policy, which has a certain um, SLA, right? So the point is that you can actually now support um, more granular fine-grained SLAs, things like um, you know lowest latency path for things that need it, for example, voice or IP or things of the nature. You can have constraints saying use only certain topology parts or you know um, uh, 
high availability or disjointness so that you can provision two paths that are disjoint from each other. All of that can be expressed as a um, segment routing policy that sets up the end-to-end -end, uh, underlay uh, transport, if you will, and then you bind a service to write on top of it. And then now with the visualization, what you're able to see is that you can see uh, which directions these um, services would go. And you can uh, see that we're using a segment routing color um, and uh, you know that that helps with operations uh, as as you have deployed a service. Next, what I'll try to show you is uh, the provisioning piece. We'll cover the optimization um, after we cover the provisioning piece. So, uh, as I uh, said earlier, and Deepak uh, mentioned as well, right? The goal is to actually deploy services directly through network controller, uh, and then uh, ensure that the optimization of the desired um, SLAs are happening real time constantly without human involvement and then support uh, operations teams to visualize and see what's happening. So we saw the visualization piece. Now let's go ahead to provisioning piece and uh, let me give you uh, an example of how provisioning works. So when you go to the provisioning screen, you can see that we have segment routing um, uh, capabilities here. You can provision a segment routing policy um, a uh, segment routing policy generally uh, is used to create your, uh, what we call a static SRTE policies. So you're gonna say that from a head end to tail end, I want a path to be picked with certain criteria. The criteria may be as rigid as an explicit path for which you would go ahead and create what we call a segment identifier list. So you give a bunch of hops that the traffic uh, path has to take, and then you associate the policy, you put the policy on head end, and that's how the total comes up. And then we have capability to do also what we call as on-demand next hop templates. So this is where the policy is not uh, configured a priori, but it is a, you give a template to the head end saying, whenever a prefix comes in with a color, you go ahead and create a, uh, a tunnel with the, uh, with the particular SLA. So the, there's a template configured on the head end saying, for this color, this is the SLA behavior, but don't create the tunnel yet. No, it's going to be dynamic depending on a prefix appearing with a color, right? So that's an ODN template. All of these are standards based, by the way, so we can support any uh, you know now routing nodes. In the crosswalk network controller, in the demo I'm showing you, we are using only iOS XR based routing nodes, um, and then uh, the actual implementation of this provisioning is done by an NSO. There's an instance of NSO that is bundled with the network controller and is sitting underneath, and we have integration with that. Um, and, and NSO, as you might have heard earlier in the day, it's a platform for automation, right? So it's a platform, but in this case, we are also giving you the, what we call as the artifact that actually provisions segment routing, right? So the segment routing core function pack is also bundled with it. And so you get the, uh, all of this uh, included with the crossword network controller. And then we give you the sample L2 and L3 function pack so that you can actually uh, create uh, a reference VPN, um, you know, implementation through provisioning here. But the idea is that since our customers deploy these VPNs in a lot of variations, we give you the starting point, you can customize it to um, you know, your specific variant uh, as you might need. So that's why we, uh, we have it as a sample function pack. So now let's go ahead and provision a policy. So let me walk you through a policy provisioning. So let's go ahead and create a SRT tunnel. So typically provisioning of a uh, fine-grained SLA-based service can be divided into two parts, right? One is what we would call as the underlay provisioning, um, wherein you're actually provisioning an underlay with a particular um, uh, SLA, right? Um, and in this case, I'm gonna use a name. You can use any name. I'm using a specific name for, uh, as a convention, other use. Um, in this case, we'll be creating a tunnel from a head end and uh, you know, the head end is going to be node five. In my network, I have six nodes. Um, and so that's going to be node five. So we are creating a tunnel policy on node five and it's going to a tail end. Um, in this case, it's going to be uh, node four, but uh, in the implementation, we have to give it the actual loopback, the traffic engineering loopback ID. And segment routing has a concept of colors and you're actually binding the SLAs to colors, head end, tail end. So it's a tuple of head end, tail end, comma, color that has a particular SLA, and that's the LSP, label switch path that's going to be created, right? So in this case, I'm going to give a color 2003, 
And if I want, I can give a binding SID that may be important if I'm doing bookend model where there is a controller sitting on top of network controller provisioning a service on the left, on the right, and the network controller controls the thing in the middle. So we can actually take a binding set that you may have given to the other adjacent controllers, uh, you know, data centers or whatnot, right? Um, that could be used to inject traffic into this tunnel. Now, next thing we would do for this color from this head end uh, to this tail end is a list of paths. You can give more than one path. These are called candidate paths and they have a preference order. So let's pick a number for preference. And uh, the way the head end, which is iOS XR based in the demo, is going to pick a path is it's going to pick the first path that is valid, meaning it can resolve end to end, right? Um, and then the paths can be uh, more than one, like, you know, you can do one or two, one or three, whatnot, uh, but I'll just pick one path. And the paths can be of two kinds, explicit or dynamic. Explicit meaning you can give a hop by hop specification of all the paths you want to go through. Um, and, um, or dynamic, right? So let's pick dynamic in this case. Um, so if you go to dynamic, you will see that you, we have a few options here. So when you pick a segment routing path, uh, dynamic optimization, um, there are two categories of things you basically specify as a, uh, 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 as a um, intent here, right? Um, so first thing is you give a SLA objective. What is the SLA we are trying to um, optimize on, right? Could be just IGP path. I mean, IGP path is what routing uses. But you could do IGP plus other things. So you may you may want to use IGP as your path um, SLA objective plus uh, additional things that I'll show. But you may want to also use a uh, TE metric. It's a metric that you decide as a service provider that makes sense to you. It may be independent of IGP, which is basically based on distance um, kind of thing, right? Routing metric. TE metric may be an independent metric that you have a choice of using. Latency is very common, particularly for latency sensitive um, services. Let's just pick latency for this demo. And as you can see, we picked dynamics so this got clicked. This is the PCE uh, notification, right? So when we click this to yes, what we are saying is um, routing node, the head end, you don't do the calculation, but go call, contact the central compute path compute engine and do the calculation. Um, let that do the calculation and you just take it, right? And there are reasons to do that. The main reason being um, a uh, routing node uh, head end uh, is basically in the, uh, in the context of path compute, it's called a path compute client. It has only the topology of the routing domain it is participating on, but typically in large networks, there are more than one. So it doesn't know about topologies beyond its own routing instance, like you know, OSPF you know, process, whatever, or ISS, whatever. But if you have, uh, for scalability reasons, have multiple, then you really need somebody externally that has visibility to all the routing domains to help you, right? So that would be the delegate to PCE. The other reason is if you're doing bandwidth, and in the left, you can see here bandwidth. So we can also, in cross network network controller, keep track of bandwidths as you're making um, LSP requests or you know SLA requests. And we can do some bookkeeping on bandwidths that have been already used. And when you ask for a new bandwidth, we can go and find paths in the network where you know, there, is a, um, there is a bucket of bandwidth available that will satisfy this particular end-to-end -end path request, right? And we can do the bookkeeping on it. And that's uh, done um, also within cross network controller. When we say PC here, um, uh, so it'll go to PC. Uh, and here are the other additional constraints. Once you've picked a SLA that you want to optimize on, you can add additional constraints. So the, the common one would be disjoint paths, right? Disjointness is basically, um, as you can see here, we have a quite a few types. Again, these are standard um, traffic engineering type of capabilities. You can avoid links from another, another LSP. Uh, you can avoid nodes and links. You can avoid what is called a shared risk link groups. Sometimes what happens is even though we think there are two different links, they may be going on same um, fiber bundle or undersea cable or whatnot. And so those are called shared risk and you really want your diversity to be uh, uh, not in the same shared risk link group, right? So that could be one. Uh, and then the shared risk, shared risk link group plus node could be uh, another one. And then you have affinity and affinity is another concept in traffic engineering where uh, you can give, uh, you have 32 bits that you can put on every interface in your network. And those 32 bits may mean things to you like as a uh, provider. Um, Common things that are there used for are marking, for example, a country. Like, you know, if you don't want your traffic to live 
uh, leave uh, your country because they are sensitive government or secure uh, military traffic, um, then you can mark the bits that belong to a country and then stay within that country. And the way you do it is you give it an affinity rule and you can say, uh, use all of the links, include all or include any or exclude any, you know, those kind of things. So if you want to exclude any undersea or satellite link, you can do that. So you'd have to lay a, a, a you know, use the 30 bits per link and lay out all those properties. And then when you request a service, you can pick an affinity to um, do any of the properties, one or more of those properties. And then our path compute engine is aware of this. This, this information, by the way, is transported in the ISIS or OSPF, uh, you know, as part of the uh, T extensions to those protocols. Um, at this point, we are ready to commit this. Uh, so basically what we've done is we have just picked a path um, and that's gonna be uh, optimizing on latency. Let me go ahead and uh, commit it. So while this is going on, let's uh, switch to active topology. There you go. So now what we are going to see is that the uh, traffic engineering policy that we provisioned should uh, show up as uh, you know, in progress of being provisioned. And once it comes up, we'll see that you know, the path for that is, uh, is, is different from the path we saw earlier on uh, with the color 2001. So now we provision this path with latency and you can see that it's, uh, it's different from the 2001 uh, path, which was doing uh, ECMP uh, because it was just doing uh, uh, IGP based metric. Now, what I'll do is to um, go ahead and use an API to provision the opposite path and then bind a service to it, but I'll use APIs going forward and um, I'll show you how that looks. So I'm going to use Postman. All right, so we have here um, a set of uh, policies that uh, I can use. So uh, we're gonna create a 2003 latency tunnel. So as you can see here, this is a JSON payload. So Postman is a common uh, tool that is used to um, test APIs. So you basically can um, put in the API endpoint up there and then you put the payload. And the payload we are giving it is to create um, the uh, uh, SRTE policy on the head end, uh, node five. Um, I'm kind of overriding what I did through UI in this, uh, but I, I'm going to scroll down and show you that I'm, I can actually stack multiple policies in this API call so I can do the other direction as well. So this is the other direction. So here we are going from node four to node five. And uh, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and click send. And what we get here at the bottom is uh, a 200 um, return code. This is basically going to tell us that uh, everything is good, right? So um, these are HTTP return codes, 200s are good. Um, so now let's back, switch back to the um, UI to take a look at uh, how it looks there. Um, so now we are going back to uh, active topology. Let's take a look at the service that came up. So as you can see, there are two 2003 uh, in each direction. Let me go back to Postman and provision a end-to-end -end, uh, path. So let me go back again to Postman. So now we're going to provision a uh, L2 VPN. So let me show you the payload for that. So here's the L2 VPN. And uh, we'll create this one. So L2 VPNs are basically, uh, there are different kinds, but what we are provisioning here is a virtual private wire service, a EVPN flavor of it. Uh, and in the payload, you will see a local site and a, a remote site, and you will see attachment circuits, which is basically the sub interface on the PE that we are gonna be bridging to the other side. Um, and let me go drop to the top. So that's a local site, uh, node five. And uh, uh, here's a key thing that we are gonna be using uh, a mapping to the uh, preferred path.
So as you see here, the preferred path, what we are saying is that when you provision the end-to-end uh, -end overlay service, uh, L2 VPN, actually take the SRTE um, C 2003 um, tunnel that we have already provisioned. So let's go ahead and provision it. Uh, and the, in, in below here, we also have the remote side, which is gonna write the tunnel on the opposite direction. So I'm going to do a send here, and we got a 200 series return code. Um, let's switch back to Okay, I need to click once. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, reload, refresh this page. So we should see a new service come up. And this time uh, the, um, the L2 VPN service is taking um, a uh, no latency path, not the IGP path, right? So let's um, click and uh, it's not responding again. Let's see what's going on here. Yeah. So let's look at only the L2 VPN services. So I had a uh, policy before, which was using a um, IGP based metric. The new one we created is going to use a um, low latency based metric and that's 2003, right? So you, you can see here, now what we'll do is to show that we can actually honor, let me actually click here so I can show you the, yeah, so we can see here we are using the 2003. Um, let's go ahead and actually shut the link between seven and eight and let's see if, uh, you know, what happens in that case and how the visualization uh, changes as well as the LSP path changes. So um, seven is connected to eight on gig 0003, as you can see. Um, so let's go to end gig zero slash zero slash zero slash three and just shut it down, simulating basically like a fiber failure or uh, some reason for having the link go down. And uh, let's switch back to the UI. So what is happening behind the scenes is that the routing already has converged, path has taken a different uh, path to go through. So now what you're seeing uh, is that the visualization of this, which um, you know, uses the um, topology information from routing should also converge and visualize um, as you can see here. So you can see that the link that we shut down is marked as red uh, with the down arrow and then the LSP path, it can actually show you what is the new path it's taking and the new path is uh, you know, as you can see here. Now what we'll do is go to segment routing Here's where we can see the two LSPs that are in the, in, the, in the play here because it's one LSP per direction. Let's pick the one four to five that we are watching. Let's go to view details and we can see the segment routing information. Um, this is the uh, part that is doing path compute, right? So the path compute engine is working constantly in the background. It's taking any topology changes that's happening and it's recalculating paths and pushing the new path to the uh, head end, right? So we, we have the equivalent metric as three which is, uh, you know, basically we have tried to reduce the end-to-end -end latency metric. And we can see that visualization on, uh, on the topology overlaid here. So let's go ahead and add, show me all the metrics that you're using. And uh, so you can see here that we are picking paths with the delay one, you know, this path one, this path one. The other paths have higher metrics. So it's actually now that this link has failed, instead of going through this path or any other path, it's picking the um, next shortest path. Um, so basically the uh, optimization engine is running constantly in the background. It's, it, can, it knows all the LSPs and all the intent, uh, intended LS, SLAs and it can keep uh, recalculating when our network change events happen and uh, pushing the new LSPs down. Um, let's go ahead and uh, you know, unshut it. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, what I'll show next is the visualization for uh, an L3 VPN. Um, and in the L3VPN case, it's a little bit different because we use uh, ODN templates. And so there are really three steps to provision a, an ODN template based um, VPN. So I have an example of this uh, already provisioned. Let me just uh, show you that. So this is an L3VPN for customer one as, a, as I've labeled it. And it has three sites, right? So there are three sites participating in this L3VPN. The route target is unique across all VPNs, L3VPNs. So we show that. 
um, and then the three sites. Now we have mapped uh, these this particular VPN um, to a set of SLAs. The SLAs are uh, by the color, right? So that's the ODN template. So all the headers know that when you get a prefix of color 4001, do a certain treatment, right? And uh, and that's configured on all the headers. All the P's are the headers because we have any to any kind of a mesh. And then for each customer prefix coming out of a site, right, from the CEs, we have a route policy that colors it, right? In this example, we have these two prefixes um, mapped to color 4001, but you can actually have um, more than one color here as well. So for example, if an enterprise customer says, I want uh, you know, low latency for my uh, white traffic or anything that's latency sensitive, I could do that. And then I can have additionally um, for you know bulk data, some other uh, class, uh, and maybe I can I can pay more or, uh, or be charged more for that, right? And once you have the service provision, you can actually go and say, okay, going from node five to node four, which path am I taking? Um, and then uh, I may have multiple colors. In this example, I have one, so let's go ahead and see you know what path I take. And then this basically um, shows you what path um, that particular color would take. In this case, 4001 is mapped to an IGP metric, so it takes that. You could add constraints on top of it to, you know, for and all that uh, uh, that uh, PE support. So all of that can be done. Um, uh, here, if you go to segment routing, here's a full mesh of LSPs that have been created to support this particular L3 VPN service. As you might expect, there are basically three sites and each direction, so you end up with um, basically um, six LSPs, a full mesh of LSPs. And I was showing you earlier, you can actually go into details here. Um, now, what I want to talk about is a little bit of uh, what, how this was set up, right? So, um, so we covered provisioning, we covered optimization that's happening all the time. Uh, in, uh, in, and this is a view that actually is part of the optimization engine view. So you can go in here and look at all the LSP details. You can see hop by hop, uh, which are the paths it's going to be uh, picking for a particular LSP. You can see bandwidth, um, you know, requested. In this case, we didn't request any, but you can. Um, and then uh, what is the PCE that's doing the job? PCE is the uh, PC that's bundled with the network controller that is doing all the uh, path compute. So that's, um, that's also, uh, you can basically get a full view of all of that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how this needs to be set up. Um, so basically um, on day, one, when you install network controller, um, you have to go ahead and add what we call as providers. So this is where we um, provide a pair it up with a SRPCE, segment routing path compute engine, and the NSO, which is going to do the provisioning part, right? So the SRPCE has BGP LS sessions. And as soon as you pair it up by in entering this information here, we can actually get the whole topology that we saw earlier, right? So this topology was discovered by uh, pairing it up with the segment routing path compute engine and setting up those BGPLS sessions from each of those nodes or those routing domains, I should say more accurately, to those SRPCs. The next thing what we do is we go to devices. Now that we have discovered the devices, we need to have a uh, set of uh, things like credentials, um, you know, SNMP and other things. So this is where we would go and specify. This is, you can say the, inventory, we can discover the devices, we can discover how they're connected, but to get say management access to it, we need a little bit more information. So that information is collected here, um, along with the credential that we would use to log in, right? So all of that's done here. Um, at that point, we are ready to uh, start collection jobs, but there is one more step to do because we for having a highly scaled up collection layer, which is actually very compute intensive, we use uh, a scale out model where we have um, data gateways. So data gateway is nothing but a separated out collection layer. So those are deployed independently. And what you do there is, uh, you, uh, it's just a VM, you set it up and you have a very minimal um, CLI where you go in and get what we call as an enrollment package. And then when you add a data gateway, you can actually uh, you know, import that file in here and a secure tunnel is built to that particular data gateway. In this case, I have one data gateway that I've already imported. And the next thing you do is you say, you know, this data gateway manages a certain number of devices. So in this case, uh, you just click the data gateway and attach devices. And from your inventory, you say, go off and, you know, collect, uh, you know, metrics and important stuff from those uh, devices. In this case, I've attached it to the, all the six nodes I have in this demo topology. So that's uh, going on. 
And you can see there are, these are the jobs going on. And I can show you a little bit of uh, what those jobs are. And um, so if you go to collection jobs, so here's where we collect things like SNMP. So if you go and see, for example, for to uh, topology visualization, we collect SNMP, right? So we collect the inter interface MIB, which is by the way, standard MIB, multiple vendors support it. We know that's how we know what the IP addresses are on those, what are the counters in terms of packet consumption, uh, you know, packet flows, data flows, all of that. We can collect uh, SNMP traps, so we can uh, listen for notifications from those nodes. Um, we can, um, uh, we do a little bit of um, uh, CLI scraping as well. Um, we can do that. And a lot of this are designed to be extendable. So if you have a particular need, particularly when you work with other vendors, we have to do some extensions to collect certain import, important information um, that can be done as well. I'm trying to think about this on a, a service provider scale and it obviously is what it's aimed at. And, and I'm trying to imagine, um, I'm trying to imagine the interface at, at that service provider scale and, I, and I'm, I, I can't. Um, I, I mean, do you, is this, is this something that, is this brand new? Is this actually deployed in service providers right now? Um, I, I don't know if there's any who you're allowed to mention. Um, you know, is, is this something that's in production right now and it's, it's being used and say, so, yeah, it scales great up to, you know, 10,000 nodes and, you know, 50,000 LSPs out there and it, it, it's not a problem. You know, you're just, filtering stuff you know i'm looking at the list of of the you know the services on the left and we have 10 services yeah well, that, that's that's great when i'm looking at that list and then i'm looking at a service provider if i'm a, you know if i'm a global service provider that's gonna get long real quick right right so right. I, i'm curious how that how you found that scaling um right. or how your customers have found the, that yeah sorry yeah, this product has been shipping since uh may of this year um so that was a 1.0 release and we have it in a lot of uh, SP customer labs, right? So they're all evaluating mm -hmm. it. Um, so, but it is designed to be scaled. So what you're looking at is a UI um, and underneath, like I said, there's NSO. NSO can scale up to tens of thousands of devices uh, and it's kind of proven. And then yeah. we have um, SRPC that does most of the path calculation as, as well as LSP. Um, and then the data collection layer, the data gateways are also designed to be scaled out, right? The whole system is running on a, the implementation based on a microservice model on a Kubernetes cluster, right? Uh, again, mainly to target this uh, this uh, this aspect that we need to scale a lot higher, right? Most of the initial customers are deploying, say, 5G, packet core, and those kind of networks. Some of them are inventory, right. other ones are a like greenfield, but um, but scale will be one thing that uh, we know that we have to scale up on and. Uh, by architectural design, it's there. Whether it has been tested or pushed beyond, uh, you know, like those numbers, uh, like 50,000 nodes, uh, I think it's early uh, days for us uh, to say that it, uh, we, have, we have crossed that bar. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether or not you'd find them in your GUI or would just be saying, you know what, we're going to do our own stuff with the API anyway. Um, <laughs> so that's a problem. We, we do expect that there'll be, a, let's say, business system that's sitting on top, a workflow engine of some sort. Uh, yeah. So we have had this API first uh, requirement. We think the UI will be mostly used uh, in an operations mode um, and maybe for engineering to, you know, uh, engineering teams and SPs to, you know, kind of fine tune their configurations and things of that nature. But on an ongoing basis, it'll be parented to uh, something on top, right? So the API um, yeah. business system will take the work order whatnot and push our APIs to do the active provision. That makes sense and, and good to hear it and NSO underneath it and because you know we, we were talking about NSO earlier today and I was I was listening to this uh, as you were starting on this and I was thinking this is sounding awfully like NS, an, another uh, you know NSO alternative why are we doing this so <laughs> it, yeah. it's good to hear it. NSO under the hood um, you know another reuse of the same technology so that's good stuff absolutely NSO is like a platform where you can you know build anything but what you have given here is something that's vertically built on top, meaning you have the NSO function packs that can provision something uh, specific like XR policies and VPNs. And then we have a way of visualizing and operating on top of such a network um, for, for day two operations as well. 
That makes sense. Can I tie it into an existing GRPC bus, whether it be import or export, from a telemetry data standpoint? What am I what am I getting out of CNC for that? Yes. So today we collect uh, the interface stats, for example, using SNMP because we found that's the only thing that works across vendors. We have a, a, a working implementation actually in the product of the Cisco MDT, model driven telemetry, but uh, we are also migrating to GNMI based, uh, you know, GRPC for network management interface based telemetry, and that's coming uh, in future.